Our next presenter, our next presenter is Piero T, and he's going to talk about can we actually tell stories in motion picture and television in 8K? I don't have to read you, Barry, everybody knows you. Thank you. Let me just get a second to turn up my laptop, make sure everything works. Good morning. Good morning. Still a little bit of a hard time getting up. So uh, this presentation is from a cinematography perspective, not from a technical implementation perspective. The question I think is valid. We're not yet fully implementing UHD and now we're already talking about super ultra, extremely gigantico 8K. So can we actually use this format to efficiently tell stories uh, either in cinema or television? So we're gonna look at a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, understanding the cinematic language and how it translates to um, the gigantic amount of information we're trying to convey. Uh, motion issues, uh, the human eye and its resolving capacity, um, you know, how much resolution can we actually see in the human eye, the types of viewing environment in which we're gonna present those uh, AK images, and a part of science uh, cognitive that is called proxemics, which is the study of interpersonal uh, distance. And you'll understand why uh, when we get there. First of all, um, cinema and heavy TV series use a series of conventions. That's kind of a tacit contract between the story maker and the people following the story. Uh, for example, uh, I know that if I was seeing this at night, uh, the moon is not fully blue like this. Uh, I don't have a super nice spot on top of my protagonist. So this is not the way night looks when you're outside, but we accept uh, when we make movies that this is the way night looks. We have a whole series of conventions in movies of what is acceptable and what is night, what is day, what is drama, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> One of the most important of those is the way we frame shots. So we say that you write a movie, you direct a second movie, and you're gonna edit a third movie. And the reason being that uh, in the editorial process to tell a scene, we're gonna use a variety of shot framings and conventions, uh, either to carry a sense of where we are or how we're supposed to feel or what the heck is going on in the story. And so we're framing from very, very far, our uh, extremely wide shot up to the close up. And these shots, it's not at random, this has been developed over more than 100 years. Uh, they convey different types of information to our viewer. The very far away shots, the extremely wide shots, give us a sense of location. This is to help us understand where we are physically uh, in our story. At the closest point, uh, the shots are there to express tension. This is how sympathetically we should feel uh, by associating our feelings with uh, protagonists. So, should I be happy? Should I be sad? Should I be tense at this point in the movie? And this is how uh, movies communicate subconsciously with the audience. And in between those two is action. This is what is going on. And the more uh, your movie is a blockbuster, the more you will have of those action movies as uh, tension is very culturally specific and mainstream movies try to target different audiences with different cultures so they put more emphasis on action where independent movie put a lot of uh, emphasis on tension. And so this is the kind of motion you can see in the shot, whether it is the camera moving or the protagonist moving or a combination of both, something we call uh, the optical flow of the shot, which is motion as seen by the sensor, which is a combination of camera and people. Basically, what I'm saying here is there's a lot of motion in uh, cinema and TV shows, especially these days. And I've done a lot of research in my past papers on this and <clears throat> Trying to get clear images with motion at very high uh, spatial resolution is a challenge. So let's look at motion in a bit more detail. This is from a previous paper. Uh, I think this one for the IBC uh, a couple of years ago. So we used a side-by-side -side system with different frame rates to capture some action. And we could see in the vast majority of cases that temporal resolution is a lot more important than spatial resolution. 
And we're pushing on spatial a lot because it is a natural progression to just increase the density of pixels, increase the flow of information. Temporal is a somewhat of a different animal, um, but definitely temporal gives us uh, a lot of advantages. So here's an example. This is from YouTube, uh, from Star Wars The Force Awakened trailer. So this is a modern close-up shot with a bit of motion. The goal of that single shot was to introduce one of the main characters and his state of mind. Very, very quick shot. This was in 4K on YouTube. This is just a 2K version, but I will advance it frame by frame. And even in 2K, uh, try to see any single frame where the character is actually in full focus. Almost there. So we basically have about one frame where the character doesn't show enough motion blur to resolve them in 2K. There's not a single frame in there where we can actually see 4K level of detail, so imagine 8K. And that this is not a, a significantly dramatic shot. The camera is locked off. The character is not moving all over the place. So just to emphasize that motion is very difficult at very low frame rates. The human, uh, someone who's in good shape, who's walking on the street, going to a meeting, is going to walk around five kilometers an hour. On uh, the maximum allowable level of motion blur varies on different factors. Uh, the distance to your subject, the focal length you're using, the size of your sensor. I won't bore you with all the details. I've covered this in previous papers. But roughly, for a medium, medium wide shot, um, even at 120 frames per, per second in 8K, if you're walking or something is moving faster than one-tenth of a normal walking pace, it's going to be out of focus. So on most shots, that means your camera needs to be locked off. You need to have very static environment. It's beautiful in 8K, but it's very hard to tell a story with a locked off camera and people not walking. So that's motion. Now, setting that aside, let's suppose that we have perfectly immobile subject, no one's moving, everything's in focus. Let's look at our eye's capacity of resolving information. So this, I'm sure you're familiar with this type of chart. It's called the Snellen chart because it was invented by Herman Snellen in 1862. And basically, it's based on human average uh, visual acuity. And if you have a 20-20 vision, which means 20 feet from the chart, I see what normal people see 20 feet away from that chart. Your vision is about one arc minute, which means that in one uh, degree of vision from your eye, you can see 60 pixels. So you can imagine this is a triangle going very, very far. So if you are closer, those 60, 60 pixels need to be very, very tight. So it means you have very high uh, pixel density. If you're going very far, the pixels can be a lot bigger. So your distance is very critical. So let's apply this into our typical viewing environments for movies and TV shows. So applying that trigonometry to a standard 65 inch uh, class high definition TV, it's 1920 pixels. If I divide this by 60 pixels per degree, it means that if my horizontal field of view uh, to view the whole screen is uh, 32 degrees and closer, this is when I start to see pixels on the screen and lose the resolution. This is where I reach the limit of the resolution. So a 65-inch class HDTV is about 56-inch in width. So if we apply trigonometry, basically if I'm 8 feet from my TV, if I get closer than 8 feet, then I'm going to go beyond the resolution, which is high def. Most people's living rooms, uh, people are seated 8 to 10 feet away from the TV, so high def works in this instance. If I take the same TV and now I put it in super ultra high definition, I now have 7680 pixels, which means a 128 degree uh, field of view, which means that if you want to view the limit of the pixels, you need to be one foot in front of the TV. So imagine you're in your living room and this is where the TV is. This is how close you need to be to a 65 inch, inch class TV 
to appreciate the difference. Ultra high def is 3.4 feet. So you need to be really, really close even in ultra high def, which is why if you put a high def monitor and an ultra high def monitor in a living room and you sit people further than 3.4 feet, they won't be able to see the difference. So that's basically what I said. Let's turn the problem around and let's say how big does my screen need to be in my living room for me to see 8K resolution? And basically, it needs to be bigger than this screen. How big is that screen? About 25 feet wide, probably? Technical guys? Below 30 feet. So it needs to be even bigger than this while you're sitting eight feet away. There's not enough room uh, for this to happen. At 4K, it would need to be 12.5 foot wide. And high def, you can go up to six feet wide. So it, there's not a single room, living room, that can accommodate this kind of resolution. In a conventional theatrical scenario, you would need to be eight feet away. So it's a bigger screen than this, 40 feet wide, and the first row here is already beyond uh, the resolving limit of 4K, uh, of uh, 8K, I mean. So what's the point? In 4K, it's 30 feet, so I can see some benefit in getting uh, 4K resolution in a theater for the people in the front rows. The one place where you really benefit from 8K is with my friends in the giant screen industry, um, where we have very, very big screen and we're very close to them. A typical IMAX, a real IMAX, not the digital uh, commercial version, but a real science center IMAX screen is about 70 feet wide. And we're putting people half screen width, so about 30 feet away, 35 feet away from a 70 foot wide screen. At 4K, the limit is 52 feet. So you can see that 4K is not sufficient in this giant IMAX world. But 8K is a bit of an overkill because you would need to be 14 feet away. So by calculating, you need about five, five and a half K of resolution. So this is one area where going beyond ultra HD would be beneficial. So I put all of this in a chart here uh, that's available in a presentation. And if you look at it in here, this is the interesting stuff. So I took all the different viewing scenarios for our content, and high def is quite sufficient for phone, tablets, and a living room TV. You're not gonna get that close that you will reach the resolving limitations uh, of high def. UHD would work great in pro gaming where you have big monitors that you're very close because you're doing a gaming application, so the degrees are much wider because the screen is close to you, and a cinema has certain benefits. Super ultra high def, really the only place I've seen where you can get real benefits from uh, the resolving capacity is in the large screen environment, or if you're extremely, extremely close to a scene. If you're very, very close to the TV screen though, that brings another issue, which is proxemics. Proxemics is uh, the study of interpersonal relationships that was, the term proxemics was coined by Edward T. Hall, who is an anthropologist in 1966. And basically, in all cultures throughout the world, we have certain spaces that we maintain between people. You know, if you get in a bus and there's people, you'll see people <laughs> will see, they will distribute the distance between them. If you have an empty row on the bus and someone sits right next to you, it's like, why are you so close to me? And we can see it today in the room. Everyone is evenly spaced out. We all keep you know, a certain distance between people. This is just natural human behavior. We have four types of spaces from public. This is when you know, you're in a group and there's someone you don't want to meet. So you're going to stay away so you don't have to acknowledge them. As you get, they get closer to you beyond a certain distance, you have to acknowledge that they're there. Hello, how are you? I don't really want to talk to you, but now I have no choice because you've entered my social sphere. So now I need to uh, exchange with you. If you get really close, so close colleagues, close friends, you're going to get into the personal space, which uh, if you don't know the person and they're getting close to you, you're going to be like, who are you to get this close to me? 
And the last level, which is for very, very few people in your life, is intimate space. That's the space where I'm actually in intimate contact with someone. The ranges vary depending on culture. Certain cultures are closer, more huggable. Certain cultures are more distant. But the variation is as follows. Beyond 12 feet, you're basically invisible in a crowd. Unless I look at you directly in the face and I wave at you, you're not there, I'm not there. It's just people in a room. When you get between 4 and 12 feet, you enter the social space. This is where you need to acknowledge people, whether you want or not. They're here, you're there, and you need to acknowledge one another. Between 1.5 and 4 feet is the personal space, and this is where it gets uncomfortable with someone that you just barely met and they're getting close to you. It's like, who are you to get so close to me? And below 1.5 foot, this is where you will get harassment if it's someone that doesn't want you there. This is intimate space. So let's translate this back into our cinematic language. At eight feet away from a 40-foot wide screen in a cinema, this is how close we need to, be, to see 8K resolution in a theater. The eye in my close-up here is going to be about 1024 by 1024. At that distance, this is what a human eye looks like. When you're creating so much resolution, all of a sudden you see all the little blood vessels, you see all the hair on your face, you see things that we're not used to see. Uh, with people and this is a nightmare for makeup because the stars they want to look perfect they want to look without blemishes but no one has a hundred percent robotic perfect flesh uh, and skin and everything so you will see hair you will see all sorts of details that we normally don't see in real life so if we want to bring our close-up a little bit less close and get it back at the limit between personal and intimate space we need to take a few steps back and I said intimate space is below one and a half feet. So if we bring it back out a little bit and we say here at the base, it says 18 uh, inches, that's one and a half foot. At that distance from someone, uh, in uh, ergonomic anthropometric data, the average human head is around 8.6 inches in height. And it's the same head height, whether you're a man or a woman. Other features will change. But in general, the brain, the jaw, and everything else is pretty stable between men and women. So if I'm 8.6 inches head and I'm 18 inches away, the vertical angle here is 25.5 degrees. If I bring this back into my theatrical scenario, it means that I'm 8 feet away from the screen and I have that degree. It means that the head is going to be about 3.8 feet high on the screen. That's the limit of how close I can be before I start to perceive that the person is entering my intimate space. And this is what it looks like. This is a close-up eight feet away in AK from a theater screen. It's a fairly wide shot. And not surprisingly, this is a shot I made on a documentary that's made for an IMAX movie. When you uh, get a very big screen or when you get very close, uh, you need to frame a lot wider than we would traditionally. So uh, translating this kind of experiences into other medium is difficult. Because if I scale down this image to present it on a tablet, now the head is too small and I can't read the person's emotion. I'm not connected into the movie. So it's not just a matter now of reframing uh, of uh, scaling down to meet uh, other medium, we now need to reframe our shots. But we're linked to certain um, focal lengths and depth of field and composition, so you're basically shooting two different movies. It's a classic problem we have in the large screen environment, like IMAX, where it's kind of hard to translate an IMAX movie into a home version. Uh, because the aesthetics, the depth of field, the composition is very different and you need to, a lot of work to adapt it and typically they're not very uh, dynamic stories. So basically, not to be a bummer, but when you apply actual science to all of those things, I'm not saying that 8K is not good, that a display that has 8K does not have its own qualities. 
I'm really talking, I want to make this clear, from a cinematic, cinematographer standpoint, where I have to shoot a story using well-established conventions, uh, it's very difficult uh, to avoid motion blur that degrades DAK experience, even at 120 frames per second. Another study I did last year, which I think the webinar is still available on the SEMTI, about center of interest motion analysis. So I analyzed top 10 uh, blockbusters from 2016. Um, and basically at 8K 120, there's maybe 20% of the shots in a movie uh, that are going to be uh, not blurry. Be to reach more than half of your movie, you need to go beyond 240 frames per second at 8K. So motion is definitely one of the limiting factors in taking advantage of such a huge uh, container. Uh, in a classic living room, forget it. Uh, you're going to get a very bright image, a very vivid image. But honestly, I could present it in ultra high def and people won't see the difference. There's not a lot of benefit in a conventional theatrical setup. If your screen is 40 foot wide, as is the average uh, multiplex, uh, there's not going to be a row eight feet in front of the screen. So the advantages of getting 8K are questionable. In the large screen environment, there is benefit to go beyond 4K, that's for sure. And we see it. I made a 120 frames per second 8K demo last year at a giant dome, and it's just breathtaking. But the shots were very, very slow because motion is our issue again. And as we've seen, to avoid getting into intimate space, and you don't want a demo where the uh, actor you can see or the actress you can see all the facial hair and stuff that's too close to someone so to get us a comfortable distance to not be in our bubble in our intimate space it means that the shots need to be shot way way wider than what is conventionally done and so you have reframing issues basically an entirely new pen and scanner each time you want to decline an ultra high def or a high def version of your asset so that's something budgetarily that needs to be considered So we have increased capabilities. Great. Let's find other areas where we could use our increase into camera technology, into bandwidth, into storage, beyond just pushing for a, a maximum number of pixels on the screen. I'm very happy to have an 8K camera at Capture, because since you know cameras are colorblind, and basically we're using a buyer pattern of red, green, and blue to subsample our image and then interpolate the missing pixels, well, I'm very happy to have 4K of green and then interpolating only the red and the blue. It's going to give me a very superb 4K image to use an 8K camera. So that already, for me, is a, a good benefit. Uh, we need to push, and this is something that is my personal crusade for many years now, we need to push increase in temporal resolution. Spatially, we've reached a maximum of human perception unless we evolve very rapidly to superhumans with very big eyes and immaculate that's twice as big in, in, uh, inside our eye to see more resolution, which is not going to happen for uh, probably a couple million years if we're still there. Let's focus on increasing the temporal resolution. This is where the real benefit to the user, the people in the room, they will see the difference. And we're not talking, you know, cinema high frame rate at 48. We're talking about going to 120 as a basis for UHD and 240 if you want to go beyond like 8K. And working on the quality of your pixels. So when we say 8K, it's kind of a package deal. It's very hard for the uh, viewer to see the difference. but we're packaging a whole lot of things in there. Uh, spatial resolution, wider color gamut, higher dynamic range, uh, which translates into more contrast, but also increased peak luminance on our displays at home. So a focus on understanding that we have enough pixels to tell our story spatially. Let's go and get less compression, more dynamic range, more color out of our pixels. This is what will impact uh, the viewer experience. And that's kind of what I had to say. I wanted to leave some time if there were any questions.
Thank you. Quite analytical presentation. Thank you. And a nice story. Uh, colleagues, here we go. Thank you. Um, I understand you were talking from the standpoint of not wanting to be a bummer, but uh, with NHK racing toward the 2020 Olympics and there's increasing talk that manufacturers here in the States are going to be introducing 8K TVs as soon as next year as a hedge against lower profitability in 4K TV. How do you reconcile your findings with the reality of the marketplace? I think, um, so how to reconcile the fact that I'm showing that 8K is not perceivable with the fact that people are manufacturing and pushing forward with it. Um, I think what we're seeing is the dilemma between push and pull, and we are pushing uh, forward with increased spatial resolution, but I'm not on the counterpart seeing the pull from the clients. Even with uh, 4K, people are buying bigger TVs, they're buying the latest, but I'm not seeing uh, customer poll to say we need more 4k I love 4k as we've seen in high def we saw a real difference what part of which was the switch from CRT to panels so I'm not saying it's not gonna happen and it's not gonna get introduced I'm just saying that we need to curb our enthusiasm for the clientele per perception of it because physically I'm not sure they're gonna be able to tell the difference we, we heard increasing talk um, with the introduction of first Blu-ray, then Ultra HD Blu-ray, about artistic intent. From your standpoint in cinematography, what does the future hold with regard to what you've laid out here and trying to display 8K in a living room setting, which you say is, I believe you use the word impossible. How does that, what does that bode for artistic intent in the home? Um, for artistic intent, it really depends on uh, what will happen from the manufacturer side. If we get 72, 84 inch class 8K TVs, I'm just gonna say from a creator standpoint, we're still within the form factor of high def. I'm gonna shoot it the way I did, it's just the audience not gonna see the difference. If they're moving with wall sized TVs in something really gigantic, then creatively I will need to change my framing. And that is a difficult choice because it also includes cost of post-production because now I need to do a pan and scan for more conventional formats and that's expensive. Not everyone will know that. So we'll have people that keep shooting the way they did and all of a sudden they present their show on a big wall. They say, this is not the way I shot it and you're gonna get creatives upset. So it really depends on what's gonna happen. As I said, we're in a push uh, approach here. We're not in a poll approach. It's not the clientele that's asking for AK. It's us that are pushing. So we'll have to see what the push is and what the offering is. It really depends on the screen size. Uh, if I may, I mean, one of the things that I saw happening in your talk was actually a, a discussion about uh, storytelling in terms of shot scale and that the shot scale needs to be coordinated with the resolution of the material, the, 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 the cameras that you're using. Um, and, and if you think a little bit about this, that then perhaps different venues, different platforms should actually be shot in different ways. So where you would use a close up in one and a medium shot in the other. Um, and, and, and so the, this sort of a, this is the beginning of, of, of building a kind of expressive use of traditional cinematic techniques um, in terms of shot scale. Um, one of the things that you might have noticed is that in the late 1920s when they were shooting films in both 70 millimeter and 35 millimeter, that the 35 millimeter were, uh, camera distance was much closer and the 70 was much further away. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but the, my, I guess my question is, so you, so. I, I feel very, very comfortable now with, with your notion of, of camera distance. What about camera movement? Camera movement in 8K is just a killer, honestly. You, you, to do, for example, just a basic pan of 45 degrees, you know, left to right would take you about a minute, a minute and a half to avoid motion blur. So 
we're basically looking at camera lock-offs. It works great in the IMAX world where you have uh, locked off camera with very, very deep focus with very closed iris and you just let the beauty of the site sink in. That works great. But cinematography wise, it's very hard to tell a compelling story that way. So it, go, it goes back to the cinematic difference between I've done cinematography on IMAX projects, I've done it on TV projects, I've done it on cinema projects. It's a different story. Motion is, is really uh, different. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Quick last one, since we're on the road. So totally agree with you on the impact of the higher spatial resolutions on TVs. Have you considered anything about head-mounted displays, what your thoughts are? I'm sorry, are? Can, can you get a bit closer? Sorry. Um, uh, totally agree with you on your thoughts with respect to um, spatial resolution on TVs in the front room. Have you looked at anything with the head-mounted display world? Have you got any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, head-mounted display basically is putting a TV right in front of you. The main factors and the resolution you need is the field of view of your HMD. And that goes again to seeing, you know, if you have a narrow, like a cardboard at 55 degrees, uh, is not going to require as much resolution as uh, 120. So you're back to the same trigonometry. Uh, and it's yet another, for the previous uh, question, cinematic language. It's another rule of composition. And it varies depending on the HMD you're using. So they're very different environments, and we need to adapt to them. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks a lot.